Hey guys, Mr. Antoon here. Today is chapter 11, the legislative branch or Congress. I'm going to make one lecture video and then you'll see the green screen where it comes in to tell you which section we're going to be on. So you guys can watch this and then pause it and come back and finish it. There are going to be six total sections and you can see again here um, our mapping for the entire unit. So uh, we're starting kind of on Wednesday, so watch the lecture video, and then that's kind of a thread through that the whole thing. But we are now going to introduce a project, our first big project, where you're going to be writing a bill. And I'm going to put you in subcommittees and have like a Senate simulation. Uh, if we were physically at school, we'd be able to go into the Shriek and Shack and get into subcommittees there, but we're going to be doing this all on Zoom. Okay? Uh, remember, there's a quiz, Chapter 11, but and an FRQ, but there's no major test until we finish the three branches of government. So that's units three, four, and five. Okay. These are the six sections you'll have to go through, and you'll see a little title slide for each one when we get to it. Um, so let's talk about the first uh, overall Congress. Uh, this is the 116th session of Congress, and a session of Congress lasts two years. So this one started January 3rd of 2019 and ends January 3rd of 2021. So this next election is big because we'll have a new Congress in terms of the House of Representatives for the most part and some of the senators because their terms are six years. So therefore, it's not every election that a House, that a senator is being elected. It's only for the House of Representatives. Um, so you could see different angles of this. You could see the last one was Obama speaking in front of the House and the Senate. So it's a joint, it's usually a joint session of Congress. This is the State of the Union. And you can see the back of Trump some famous people in the front rows, at least the senators that you're seeing here. So here's a big situation. What happens if this building gets attacked by a terrorist? Uh, so we have a fail safe, and that's the question I want to ask you. What's our fail safe if a terrorist attacks, kills most of the people in this room, including the president and vice president? Well, we have a designated survivor. No, not Kiefer Sutherland or Jack Bauer from 24. <laughs> Uh, I know he had his show, and I, I did watch that first episode. It is actually, uh, we pick one of the people who was in the secretary. Nobody knows who it is. And the last one was the 53rd United States Secretary of the Interior. So you can see it's David Bernard. Bernhard. Bernhardt. Okay? Just kind of a side note. Now, again, you guys can take notes during this if you want. Usually in class, physically, we will take notes during this. So it's up to you. You're not going to get any points for this. But again, I give it to you just in case you want to walk through and, and stay engaged as you listen. So you can see what they kind of look like. They're just tables and, you know, you're, you're just trying to set up your notes and categorize stuff as you take them to make it easier for you to kind of see. So section one is representatives and senators. And you can see the learning target there and what you need to do to characterize their background. So let's start off with the dem uh, demographics. So what's the definition of demographics? It's a simply a study of the population and the groups within it. And as you can see here in America, in about 2017, we still haven't, we're in the middle of a census, meaning after 2020, we'll, we'll, we'll know our new population, at least roughly. It's not going to be exact, obviously. But in this case, we had about 321 million people. I think we're in about 335 now. And the white population is about 73% of America. The black or African is 12.7%. Hispanic or Latino is 17.6. Again, you can see the other ones. Those are the top three we have. And then below that, you could see uh, white, non-Hispanic, black uh, or African-American, non-Hispanic. So they just categorize it in different, different ways. So I want you to keep that in mind as we look at the demographics of Congress. So it's a representative form of government, meaning we elect these people. Ever since 1913, the senators are now elected just like the House is. We've always elected directly the House which is supposed to be a big reflection of the people, but the senators are a little different. So here's my big question to you. Should Congress reflect demographics of the constituents it represents? And you can see again, just the population in America in, in 2017, that um, pyramid population chart. And the answer to this question is an, is an overwhelmingly yes, because we, rep we directly vote for them. So usually they're supposed to reflect who we are. And I want you to keep that in mind because The Guardian, which is a British newspaper, uh, talks about, and it's good to go to other countries' newspapers because they're going to be more unbiased. They're going to cover mainly the facts of it. And this is 2018. Uh, does the new Congress reflect you? So 
On the left, you're going to see the grid, and the, the one on the top is the House, and the one on the bottom is the Senate. So just so you know how Congress looks when you see these graphics. So that's the 115th uh, Congress, and then the 116th. And, it, and the difference between those two is 6.93% more Democratic Party than prior. And that's a direct result of the midterm elections uh, when Trump had his, it's a check on Trump. So you can see the same thing happened to Obama, and I'll show you this on the next chart or coming up. But these are our House representatives by state. And if you look at Texas guys near the bottom, you're seeing this is this is Austin. There's uh, San Antonio's down here. There's Houston, and then there's Dallas. And then it's mainly the southern border, but a lot of Texas is red. But cities have more people. So let's see what happens in this next election. We know the election, sen senatorial election in 2018 was close between Ted Cruz and Beto O'Rourke. So Texas is slowly changing towards more of an even. Uh, I wouldn't say that. I still think it's conservative. But again, it's just something to think about in terms of what it visually looks like. So the start of a new presidency, the 112th Congress in 2009, when Obama took over, was 257 to 178. This is in the House. And you could see, again, I just want to make sure you know that's Obama. And in 2017, you could see that, that people were upset after eight years of Obama, and they flipped it under Trump. So in Trump's first term, you know, after his election, you could see the House flipping because you're also going to see a lot of stuff like this. This is a great graphic to show you how the president's party fared in the midterm election. So this is a check on the president. You can go back to 2010. Look at Barack Obama as a Democrat. He lost 63 seats in the House, and that's not even the record. The record is down at FDR uh, at 72, and I think Harding, no, sorry, Harding is at 77. So you could see it is a big test on the president. And when he passed Obamacare, a lot of people were upset about it. So that's why they removed him or removed a lot of representatives because they wanted to take away Obama's power. So Trump did take a hit, but it wasn't that big. It did flip the House. He had the House in the majority for Republicans. So it is a check and balance on the president. Hopefully you get that as we progress through all this stuff. So let's continue to look at the demographics. As you can see here, the um, 116th Congress, 47% um, are Democrats and 53%. No, this, I'm sorry, that's the Senate. I apologize. That's the Senate. Then it has the majority there. And of those senators, you could see a new member uh, took office since 2014, split ticket state, women, black, and so on, all the way down the list. And I want you to look at diversity between these two, two parties here, because that's a big one. Which party is the most diverse? And if you look at here, this is the grid for the House now, not the Senate, because it's a lot more, it's more than 100. And as you can see here, the Democratic Party has a lot more diversity. You have all the white Republicans in the, in the kind of a light red or pinkish color. And then you could see a few Hispanic, uh, one Asian and one black Republican. So you're seeing the diversity mainly for the Democrat side as opposed to the Republican side. Um, religiously, you can see here, this is the makeup of the 116th. M majority of both the House and the Senate are Christian. And underneath that, that umbrella of Christianity, you have Protestant, okay? You have Catholic, and that kind of makes up the most, and even Mormon. Then you have Jewish, you can see there's unaffiliated, Buddhist. So there's a, there's, the, the diversity is mainly about 60, 70, 80% Christian, which is what our country really is. It's a good reflection of that to a degree. So you could see where 80% or 80% of America is Christian. So very close to what we are. Just to give you the, just a rough estimate. Again, guys, there's many studies out there on this. I'm just trying to get, get you to understand uh, the rough reflection of what representatives should be. Um, so what percentage of the American population is composed or comprised of females? And again, this is a rough estimate, but it's more than 50%. Let's say it's 51%, the gender distri distribution. And when I look at the House, um, the House seats are at 22% now. So it went from 19 to 22 as from the 115th to the 116th. And that is not a good reflection of the 51% of females in America. So women have a very small, they're underrepresented in Congress. And there is the Senate. It's a little better, you know, 23% of women 
and you can see it's, it's uh, seven Republicans. And you can see, I'm not going to count them all, 5, 10, 15, 16. Oh, it says it right there. <laughs> 16 Democrat women. So you could see it is increasing, but it really should be at 51% and then have the majority of women in Congress over men, just because of our population. But it, we'll see how long it takes, it takes to reflect that. And you can see here uh, the percentage of women by party in the House and the Senate since 1917. And right around 1990, when I was in college, this was the Anita Hill, Clarence Thomas, who's a Supreme Court justice, trial about his sexual harassment on her. Ever since then, especially in the Democratic Party, we've had a rise, a major rise compared to the Republicans. And again, you can see all the graphics here that kind of reflect that. And again, Trump does laud women, and he does uh, appoint women to the office. But you can see us at 23.5%, and this is 2018. Look at how we compare against the other countries. So women are completely underrepresented in our country. Um, countries uh, in Africa, um, you can see Cuba, who is a communist country to some degree. Um, other countries here as well, showing a way larger amount of women running things as opposed to in, in America. So why aren't there more women in Congress? Well, here's some of what the textbook gives us as answers. Uh, number one, fewer women run. Okay, I see that. A lot of people say it's because of childcare, because you know, the, the, they, if they want to have whatever amount of kids they want to have, it's going to take away from their job. They have to take a leave of absence. Um, for the first time ever, we had a senator give birth in office as a senator. And you could see here, Tammy Duckworth uh, was expecting, and this was in 2018, but she did deliver. She's a Democrat from Illinois. And again, she set some issues. She was a former, uh, uh, she's a veteran and she fought in Iraq and she lost, I think she lost her, legs too as well. So really, really cool story um, in terms of recovering and becoming a representative in our country. Uh, they say they're risk averse. Women are not, are more reluctant to take chances or risks. I don't know if you agree with this, but again, it's out there saying that they're risk averse. And then bias must be more qualified than a man to take, to, to win over, uh, especially to beat a man. And again, I think this is all antiquated. I think women are just as capable as men. But again, we as a country don't think that. And you could see the rise of women in, in Congress over time from uh, right around the 65th maybe up to May. I think this goes up to like 2010-ish. But again, you're seeing a rise of women. But again, it's not where it should be, obviously reflecting the 51% of women in our country. And you could see Hillary Clinton broke some barriers, Nikki Haley on the right, um, Nikki Haley is a former governor of South Carolina, former UN ambas U.S. ambassador to the U.N. They're saying that she's going to run for president someday. Uh, I heard that she might have replaced Mike Pence on the ticket, but that hasn't happened as of September of 2020. So you guys can see uh, the power there. And then we have the vice president, Kamala Harris, or excuse me, the nominee for the Democratic Party, Kamala Harris, who is a U.S. senator from California, Democrat. First, you know, she's partially Asian, black to win the VP, uh, uh, to run for the vice president. So you could see the power of changing women, but when, who's going to be the first woman president or female president in our country? It's something to think about as we move forward from this. But again, a record year for running 2018 when most women ever ran for office. So things are changing. So let's get back to this de uh, demographics. And you could see, remember, whites were 73, blacks were about 12% or 13%. So in the House, that's a good reflection. Look, it's actually good. 75% white, it's a little more than average. 12% black, a little less than the average. And I'm gonna picking those two just to show you. But look at how different it is in the Senate. 91% of senators are white, 3% are black. So again, it doesn't truly reflect. And the senators usually have a little more power unless you're the House Speaker of the House or a whip or something along those lines there. So again, I wanted to show you the checks. It does represent in the Senate, it does not. Let's finish up demographics with ages. In the House, you can see in the 115th, at least, you can see the average ages looking right around high 50s to low 60s, and the senators look even older than that, mid 60s. These are older people, and why do we elect older people? Is it because they're, they've been around the block, they're wise, they're smarter, they've seen things, we trust them? Well, again, it's up to you. Um, our presidents for 2020, 
Trump is going to be running for re-election and Joe Biden, they're both going to be the oldest presidents ever to, to, if they win. So it's weird to see how old we go with presidents, especially since Obama was in his 40s when he started and then Bush was in his higher 40s when he started. So the last two before that were younger. And even Clinton, holy smokes, I think he was 43 when he started. So it's interesting to see how we, how we change around when it comes to that. And again, there's the median age for, for uh, 116th. 62 and 64. And then you can see generational ones. You can see the, these are generations. So my generation is the generation X between 36 and 51 years old. There's 117 members of, of the house and then baby boomers, 270 and then silent, even older, 42 members. So you're just seeing the different age and different generations that go on there. And then I'm going to play this video for you because 116th was the most historic Congress, especially for diversity ever. And you can see they're the most women, first Native Americans, first Muslim, first openly LGBT plus, and the most black members at out. So here's the video. I now call the House to order on behalf of all of America's children. That's it. Welcome back. Indeed, it is an historic day on Capitol Hill. To the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, I extend to you this gavel. So there it is. Nancy Pelosi holds the speaker's gavel once more. It's been more than 50 years since the speaker regained the gavel. But today is historic for many more reasons. The 116th Congress includes more than 100 women, a new record for this nation. Women like Deb Holland of New Mexico and Sharice Davids of Kansas, the first Native American women to serve in Congress. Women, women like Ilan Omar and Rashida Tlaib, the first Muslim women to serve in Congress. This Congress also has the largest congressional black caucus ever, 55 members. The largest congressional Hispanic caucus too, 37 strong. Iowa elected women to Congress for the first time. Texas elected its first Hispanic woman to federal office, and Florida elected the first South American member of Congress. Massachusetts and Connecticut elected their first black congresswoman, and New Jersey elected its first Asian American congressman. New Hampshire, Minnesota, and Kansas have their first openly gay representatives, and California has its first bisexual congresswoman. This is the 116th Congress, the diverse representatives of a diverse nation. Hello, YouTubers. If you're watching this, it means you've checked out our channel. So thank you. Now do me a favor. All right. So again, let's talk about more, just, just to quickly, the, the money they make. So the salary of that, the basic salary is $174,000. You get office space for free in D.C. where you work, as well as your home state or district with staff, paid staff. It's pretty amazing. I would love this. I can't imagine having 10 people working for me as a teacher. We'd have the craziest projects going on, but it'd be fun. Um, you get travel allowances and franking privileges. Uh, so they call the, the, you know, when you get travel allowances, like a junket. So you get like, I think it's 50,000 or something around there. They get, they get money to go on. Let's say I want to go research uh, cancer preventing drugs in South America. Uh, taxpayer money will pay for that. Okay, we all, we all get that. Franking is pretty cool as well. It's you, because if, let's say I'm a representative for your district, I can, any, any postage I need to send, it's all free. I just had my signature there and I'll show you in a second what it looks like. There it is, Congress of the United States. And they just put a, his signature there or her signature and it's free. So that's a huge advantage for an incumbent, somebody who's already in office. And again, you can see back here that the vice president, um, minority, majority leader, speaker of the house make more money based on doing more work for it. But again, guys, this job is not easy. It's long, long hours, pressure away from family, pressure from the community. You're not going to make everybody happy, and I can't imagine how tough that is. But I did get a free package. You can see it says my name there at Westlake High School and Roger Williams, the representative from District 25 here in Texas, who's Westlake's rep, sent me some pocket constitutions. And look, no postage. I love it. I'd send out, I just sent out my face to everybody. Okay, so again, you can see the average senator's salary compared to the American salary. This goes up to about 2014. But again, money pretty much has stayed the same uh, for there. There's the amount of work they put in. I mean, you can pause it and look, guys. Uh, you can see right now we're September 12th of 2020. They don't really work on the weekends there. But 
uh, during during the week they're going to be doing. I'm just I have some things hidden in the way. Let me see. So you can see both chambers for the past week. Next week it's both chambers as well. Just to give you an idea of that. And then there's a typical day for somebody in Washington and then back in their home state. They work from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. That's 12 hours a day there. And then they come home at 7.30 to 9.30. That's 14 hour days. So you're seeing guys, it's not easy. And usually they're, they're, everything, there's no isolation by yourself. You're working with people. You're taking work lunches, work dinners. You're working out. If you're going to a gym, you're working out and talking to people. It's a constant. And if you really like that, that's something for you. But again, very chaotic, but very organized as well at the same time. So again, remember in DC and then back in their home state or district. Okay, so we're done with section one. You can pause, come back to this if you need to later but I'm gonna continue on. So this is congressional elections. So who wins the elections? Well, look at the incumbency rate. Incumbency, an incumbent is simply somebody who owns office. And as you can see here up to 2010, 2014, the house reelection looks like around 90%. And then you could see here the house and the Senate. Well, who of those two, this is an FRQ question in the future, has higher reelection rates and why? Well, it's the house because of other reasons. We'll go over that in a second. So an incumbent is somebody who already holds office. So President Trump in 2020 is the incumbent president. Biden is the challenger. So hopefully you get that basic there. So again, about 90% and about 85-ish for the Senate. Again, it's, it ebbs and flows, but that's on average. And all of these representatives, especially the House, perceive themselves as vulnerable. And what that means is the House is constantly running they work for two years. Their terms are two years. So really for a year, they're doing work. And then for a year, they're campaigning. That should not be the way it is. They should be working and obviously doing some campaigning, but we should have some limits, which we don't, on campaigning and finances towards those campaigns. So again, senators, same thing, but they got six years. So Ted Cruz just won in 2018. He's not up until 2024. But again, he doesn't have to worry about reelection now. He can do his work in office you know, for the next four years until he gets either reelected or he gets ousted. Um, so they're, they're, they're uh, fundraising and campaigning almost all the time. And you can see here, Trump, this is in uh, 2019, in his first two years in office, Trump raised a record $130 million and has spent all of it but 19 million. So again, um, you're seeing how different presidents deal with different things, especially for reelection. Because if Trump wins, he doesn't do any fundraising anymore. He's done. He's a, he's a lame duck president if he wins a second term. So the advantages of incumbency, guys, is somebody who's already in office already has constituent contacts uh, with its people. So here is Michael McCall. He's my rep in District 10 in the House. And he had former, uh, he had kids that went to Westlake as well, I think Lake, Lake Travis as well. But again, he's very powerful. Uh, so he sends out, this is emails that he receives and he gets it for free. He can either send me stuff or he actually emails me, which I've subscribed to all my representatives anyways, whether or not I'm, I voted for them or, or not. Again, they're, they're working for me in a sense. And they, they claim credit for a lot of stuff. So that means like what casework you're doing. So let's say I built this tunnel for you. I'm going to say I use federal funding to help this tunnel to save traffic. And this is in Boston anyways. So it's, I wouldn't do that here in Texas, but I'm just saying you help individual district people for, for casework and then pro, uh, pork barrel projects is for your whole district or your whole state. Again, there's a cartoon which kind of represents it to some degree. Uh, earmarks are simply year to year. We keep bookmarking budget items that stay on our budget year to year. And that's earmarking. And a lot of times Democrats want to keep doing that. And what it does is it makes the fat of spending more and more and more, whereas the conservatives want to take this away. They want to get rid of the earmark. I didn't say Democrats don't want to do this, but this is a tough one. When you can see it says trends in earmark spending, they took a moratorium during uh, Obama's time, and now we, it's rising up again in terms of how we spend money on book or earmarked items. Just other ones. There's another one. He's asking me questions about, do I need help with a federal agency? Again, here are the dates he's going to be speaking. He's showing transparency as my uh, leader. Um, and here, this is Susan Collins. She's Maine senator. She said, here she is credit claiming, I recently helped secure a $4.2 million defense contract for a company in her state, showing that she's doing the work. And there are the pictures here touring the facilities. So again, it's pretty cool to see that. So incumbents, these are the longest serving incumbents in the history of America, our, our, our Congress. And you could see there John Dingle, 
59 years tenure. I'm not even 59 years old. I've been teaching for 22 years. I cannot imagine doing something for 59 years straight. And you can see some of the famous ones, John Conyers. Uh, you could see if they retired, resigned. Sometimes they die in office. But again, very powerful individuals. And this is a couple years old. There might be other people on the list, but I don't think anyone's gone past 59 years. And again, you can see John Conyers and Strom Thurmond and the amount of time they spent, which is very, very impressive in terms of time put in. So here are our reps here in Texas. On the left, you can see there's Michael McCall, who's my District 10. Uh, Chip Roy, he's brand new in 2018. Uh, uh, he's District 21. Roger Williams has been there since, well, he was started in 2012, but he was reelected in 2018. And he did visit our campus. I think I have a picture coming up. And then the only, the lone Austin rep in the house is Lloyd Doggett. And he's in the 35th district, mainly Southern Austin. Uh, in terms of our senators, John Cornyn's our senior senator. Uh, he was elected in 2002, so he's been there the longest. And then Ted Cruz was elected in 2012, and his reelection is up in 2024, whereas Cornyn's in 2020. He's the junior senator. Hopefully you see that. So there is where Roger Williams came to our classroom. And believe it or not, guys, it was during semester finals. So we had to pause the final. Uh, Principal Ramsey came in. Uh, Representative Williams came in. And I called him Mr. Williams. I, I feel horrible. I wish I could have that moment back because I'd love to say Congressman Williams. It's an honor. You know, it'd be cool to meet somebody in the federal government like that again. But he came there and you could see the dates and stuff and gave it to Sean Bald, uh, a nomination for the Naval Academy. Pretty cool moment. And then he did sign this. We took a picture pointing to his picture on the wall. And again, he said, Jeff, you are a patriot. Your pal, Roger Williams, U.S. Congress. Well, just so you know, from for the future, my nickname is the Patriot because of this. And it's in my classroom somewhere. So I thought it was funny. Okay, so advantages, you get to take a, 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 a position. So if I'm Ted Cruz, I could take a position on conservative values because most of Texas is conservative. And it reflects most of the people, the majority of people in Texas. So again, you've heard Trump say this, and I think I have the, the audio of it. Trump said this. Where I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose any voters, okay? It's like incredible. So he said that, and it was not a joke. And you could see the cartoon that's making fun of it here, saying he could shoot somebody and people still would not disagree with him. Well, he's done a lot of wrong things in the past four years in terms of breaking the rule of law. But... He continues to do it and he continues to be, have a chance to win the next election. So it's a strong reflection of those Where people around I could stand you. in the middle of Fifth Avenue Sorry. and shoot somebody and I wouldn't I'll lose any voters, it okay? It's like incredible. So uh, weak opponents. I mean, you could, if you're a video gamer, you know what a noob is or a rookie or default or whatever you call them as an insulting name. Opponents are deemed as weak because it's very hard to challenge. So Biden is the underdog supposedly against Trump. Even though Biden is leading in some of the polls, it's interesting to see how this looks. Uh, campaign spending. Uh, this is simply how much money you spend to, to run for office. And look, a one Senate campaign spent 7.3 million since last October. So senators spend about 10 million, House spends about 1 million. And you could see here, look at how much money uh, was contributed to Beto O'Rourke at $60 million and Cruz got 35 million. And that made it a close race. So it's really interesting to see that and again, uh, Cruz won by uh, two percentage points in Texas for the Senate. Very close, but again, Texas is slowly changing and evolving over time. Challengers are considered naive, but sometimes incumbents are vulnerable. If they step out of line in terms of how they spend money, if they go through a scandal, and here are some scandals, or I'll show you some scandals in a second. Uh, redistricting, this is something that this, the, uh, we do every, I mean, the state can do it every couple of years when things change, but every 10 years we do a census then we do redistricting of seats, and then things could change in your state. Uh, you can be pushed off your turf. Uh, it's the public mood. You know what? Maybe Cruz looks too much like a Trump Trumpite, so maybe we hold that against him and then kick him out in the next one or, re or elect somebody else. And you could see here, uh, this is this guy's. And he was a rep in New York who also wanted to run for mayor. Uh, he was busted for a scandal. He was sexting underage girls. And his name was Anthony Weiner, no pun intended. You can see the New York Post saying, Pop goes the Weiner. Um, another mayor from New York, or he was governor, Governor Spitzer, um, got caught with prostitutes. So the scandals will kick you out. Okay, not everybody. Uh, we know that Trump has been accused of over a dozen women of sexual assault, 
and he's still our president. So he's impervious to a lot, which is really interesting. Um, Al Franken, a senator from Minnesota, who was a comedian from Saturday Night Live, took this photo pretending to grab somebody and got busted and had to step and step down himself. The Democrats forced him to step down. He was a Democratic senator. So again, this looks bad. And again, I know he's kidding, but this is a big no-no. So scandals will get rid of you quickly. Uh, Virginia governor, who's still in office, wore blackface here on the right. You can see they went to uh, Halloween and he wore blackface. This is his senior yearbook on the right. He's still governor of Virginia. So you could see some are impervious, some aren't. Sorry, I gave you a lot, but again, I want to get that. Still governor. Um, lastly, or last part of this, there's open seat stability and change. Uh, a vacant seat, um, no incumbents running, meaning let's say Obama runs for president and wins. His Senate seat in Illinois was, was open. So it can be a death, resignation, re retirement, expulsion, election to other offices like Obama situation. And then this is where the most turnover occurs in Congress. Um, judge Roy Moore, uh, he was a judge and he got busted. Uh, he was part of the birth certificate scandal for, for, but he had busted for sexual assault with a 14 year old, a 16 year old, or 28 year old, even though that's a scandal, um, that was an issue for him being kicked out to vacate his seat. So you could see some of the issues that can happen for that. Um, the stability that you hear like the, uh, at the top, they, they develop this expertise. So Ted Cruz has been there since 2012. So he's been there eight years. He has that expertise. He knows how to run things. So it becomes more stable. And that's what we want our Senate to be the most is stable. That's why they're not reelected every single election. A third of the Senate gets, is up for election every, every election. So you guys can see how it works. Uh, term limits. We do not have term limits on, the, on Congress. And there's a lot of people who believe we should limit them. Ted Cruz is one of them. Here he is in bearded form saying that we should have senators run for two terms, that's 12 years, and House run for three terms only for six years. I agree somewhat with this, but again, you guys can make your own opinion on that based on term limits. Okay, we're at 11.3. I'm going to go ahead and pause the video and we'll see you on the next one.